Hello, Year 11. I'm sure you're just overjoyed at the sound of my voice that you've missed just so much uh, since school closed. Well, have no fear, your daily dose or weekly dose of Mr. Hodge is right here. We're going to be looking at the differences between Vaishnava and Shaiva worship today, and there's going to be a number of key terms that you probably only had introduced to you in the last lesson we did online on worship. So I'll try and explain those in a bit more detail as we go through. Now my videos are limited to a 15 minute time limit, so I'm hoping we can get through this in that time. If not, I'll have to spill over to a second one. But uh, as I won't be able to take wonderful questions from you all, uh, we probably can pretty much shoot straight through this. Remember that if obviously I go too quickly, you can always rewind the video and catch up on anything that way. Only two things were put in today's lesson folder. One was the PowerPoint that I'm going to show you here, and obviously if you have it there, uh, you can look at it in your own time. There's also a worksheet with the outline of two people, one labeled uh, Vaishtavite and the other Shaivite or similar, um, which will form the sort of written bit of work for today. But first, can you remember the story of Svetaketsu that we learned way back at the beginning of Hindu beliefs? If you can't, this was a story about a young boy who uh, was trying to sort of demonstrate to his father that he learned so much about the world and so much about God, but didn't really understand Brahman. And so they had the part where he had to take salt water and uh, salt, sorry, put it into water to make salt water. And his father asked him questions about, you know, can he see the salt, but he can taste it. Um, and you rep representing the idea that Brahman is in everything, even if you can't see him, he's still there. Now, this story um, is, ooh, hang on, my PowerPoint's going to work if I click it. There we go. Uh, stories like this come from a part of Hindu scripture called the Upanishads. And the idea here is that by studying and understanding the story, you're following what is sometimes called uh, Yanana Yoga. I'm assuming Yanana, it might be Janana, but let's go with Yanana. Um, yoga as a word is probably something you normally think of as sort of exercise uh, routine. Um, and of course, the word yoga does come from Hindu practice, but yoga basically means a path towards God. And there are different types of yogas uh, in Hinduism. And yana yoga is one type of that. And this is the path of knowledge. So spending time on stories like Svetaketu and trying to understand them is representing the path of knowledge. And the aim for a person following Yanana Yoga would be to remove the veil of Maya, the veil of illusion, um, by following the path of knowledge. So to see beyond the falseness of our reality to the truth of Brahman beyond. We're going to ignore this bit about the strainer uh, because we didn't do that experiment. Uh, but don't worry, you can understand just fine without. So today we're looking at the difference between Vaishnava and Shaiva Bhakti. And this word Bhakti right there <clears throat> is one that we haven't really come across before. Bhakti, or something that's called Bhakti Yoga, is simply a sort of love and devotion towards God. And so depending on whether you're a Vaishnavite or a Shaivite, the way you show love and devotion towards God is slightly different. Now, obviously all Hindus do worship, and worship is part of Bhakti, okay? But this particular form of yoga, Bhakti Yoga, really emphasizes that sort of emotional devotion and love for God, uh, which is one of the many pathways. So, remembering Vaishnavites now, remember we said Vaishnavites are Hindus who worship Vishnu as supreme god, okay? And so all of their beliefs and practices are going to revolve around this idea that Vishnu is the supreme being. It's often said that Vish uh, Vishnu Vaishnavites are personalists. In other words, they see God in a very personal sense as a being they have a sort of more direct relationship with, perhaps not entirely different to, you know, uh, like Christians talk about having a relationship with God, you know, and this idea of a relationship to this other figure. And so back to yoga, this love and devotion is very common in Vaishnavite worship, and that might be directed towards Vishnu or perhaps one of the uh, avatars, Krishna is a particularly popular one for that. Now we can fit this together with the Dvaita worldview, and remember that's the dualist worldview, the belief that Brahman and Atman are two separate things. And so Vaishnavites tend to be dualist because their soul, their Atman, is separate from Brahman, uh, Vishnu, and therefore this is either this personal relationship between these two separate beings. Now as a side note, I should point out that just because it's common for Vaishnavites to be uh, followers of Dvaita doesn't mean they can't follow Advaita Vedanta 
also. Uh, there are some who do, but perhaps it's more common to be uh, following Dvaita Vedanta. So they're going to focus on worshiping God through back to yoga, and there are a number of ways it's going to happen. It's going to be a lot of prayer, a lot of worship, uh, might be singing through kirtan and bhajans, um, and some of the other key terms that you learned yesterday. But the idea is that it's about showing devotion, and uh, you know maybe it's about reading scriptures, uh, mantras, um, and imagining sort of their relationship with God and, and that sort of closeness that they can have. Now, it has been suggested um, this will tend to be lower class Hindus. Now, I don't know if there's a particular significance for that. What I do know is that Vaishnavites are a far larger group than Shaivites. Okay, so many times, I think at least twice as large, not three times as large in Hinduism. So there are far more Vaishnava worshippers, which might suggest then why this would include perhaps many of the lower uh, Varnas. Important place for Vaishnavites is Vrindavan Forest, uh, because it's where Krishna grew up, uh, according to the stories. So, of course, it's going to be an important place for them. And there are other places dedicated to Vishnu that are very important around India as well. Now, if we swap to the Shaivites for a moment, um, obviously worshippers of Shiva as supreme god. And that's, you know, going to have a significant difference on their approach to worship for a couple of reasons that I'll come to. Um, the path of Shaivism is perhaps more commonly impersonal. Um, this perhaps the idea of seeing Brahman more as a Brahman Naguna, Brahman without qualities as much, um, even though you still have this idea of you know, Shiva, but Brahman perhaps less focusing on the, the personal aspects uh, and more the, the transcendent aspects. And again, this fits very well with the Advaita worldview, remember, which says there's not two. There is no separation between the soul, the Atman, and God. Um, and so, you know, this sort of trying to understand the truth of God and the truth of reality is sort of trying to understand truth within themselves as well. And again, as I said before, just because it's common to be an Advaita Vedanta uh, follower for Shaivites doesn't mean they can't follow Dvaita Vedanta as well. The favored path here, then, is the path of knowledge, our Yanana Yoga, this idea of trying to use wisdom and reasoning to understand the world and then seeing beyond that to the truth of, you know, true reality, which is permanent, which is Brahman. Remove the veil of Maya, remove the illusion and see what is really there. And this tends to be favored by perhaps higher class Hindus, and as I said, there are fewer of them. Varanasi is a particularly important sacred site for Shaivites, but again, there are others. Probably not as many sacred sites for Shiva as for Vishnu, but still quite a number. We're talking about, you know, one of the most popular uh, gods in Hinduism after all. Now, your worksheet gives you these two outlines, one for Shaivites, one for Vaishnavites, and the idea is that you essentially annotate each figure uh, inside or around it with key bits of information about the different ways they understand God and different forms of worship, okay? So it might be you've just been listening to this point, you want to grab that worksheet now, or if you want to wait till the end and then do it with some of the notes. It's up to you if you want to try and print out the worksheet and annotate it, or just copy the basic outline into your text, uh, exercise book and, and do it yourself. It doesn't matter either way. The important thing is to get the information down. Now, when it comes to the particular styles of bhakti, styles of worship that we'll see, there is a noticeable dis difference between the uh, Vaishnavites and the Shaivites. Now, for Vaishnavites, what we're actually thinking of for most forms of worship is very similar to what you were looking at yesterday. You'd see the traditional puja in the mandir. You'd be moving around the different shrines of the different gods. Obviously, they'd be focused on murtis for Vishnu or avatars of Vishnu. But the way that puja is performed, songs are sung, these sorts of things, all very familiar to what you've already seen in some of those videos and, and things that you studied yesterday. So Vaishnavism worship looks very much like general worship in a mandir. For Shaivites, there is a slightly different form of worship. They, Because, of course, this is more of an impersonal approach to God, um, they tend to do less with the Murtis. I mean, I'm not saying never, of course, but they actually represent Shiva in a less personal way, and this is where the Shiva Linga comes in. Um, most temples dedicated to Shiva will have one of these. In this country, obviously, your mandirs tend to be just sort of a, for all sorts of different Hindu groups to come to, so you may well f see a Shiva Linga in amongst other Murtis. Uh, and it looks, uh, well, like this. Okay, and I've got a couple of examples to show you here. Uh, 
in this case, they are bathing the uh, Shiva Linga in milk. That's one of the things that they sometimes do. Um, now, sometimes water and honey, and you can see a nice example here uh, with garlands and flowers. Now, what the Shiva Linga actually represents, there are, well, multiple schools of thought. Um, the more popular, I say more popular, because what I mean is um, the one that gets the most attention is the idea, and I'm going to use my mouse here to point out, that what the Shiva Linga actually is representing, well, this column here is representing a rather intimate part of Shiva. Yes, we're basically saying this would represent Shiva's penis. And in some understandings, this area here would then represent the female genitalia. And so with the two together, you have this sort of completeness of male and female. Now, this interpretation um, is one that I have heard many times throughout the years. And um, depending on who you ask, uh, some Hindus would say that's a very vulgar Western interpretation, you know, Western values being put onto a, a, a Hindu ideal that aren't there. And it's just kind of crude and it's utter rubbish. OK, and I completely understand their thinking. It sounds like the sort of Western misunderstanding. The problem is I then hear others who go, no, nope, it's absolutely meant to represent uh, male and female genitalia. So I'm honestly not sure which is more accurate. And if you look it up online, search carefully, um, then you may well find more information. The more perhaps um, uh, PC explanation is that actually the Shiva Linga represents Shiva's cosmic power. And in the worship of it, worshippers are worshipping Shiva and Brahman in this sort of impersonal way as this sort of source of power in the universe. And so the milk and the garland and honey is just, you know, giving uh, the traditional sort of precious things that people can give. Um, whichever way you slice it, um, I would certainly say the cosmic power interpretation is probably the more useful for our purposes. But you are welcome to your own very careful research and see what you find. I don't want angry emails from parents saying, why is my child searching Shiva's penis on the internet? So please don't do that, OK? Um, but you can note the shape is generally fairly similar in, regarding the different examples. And some of these are you know, very old ones, um, but still the basic same shape. And the size of them may change, but the essential form of worship is very similar. You want to add that to your diagram, feel free. Just be tasteful about these things. Um, back to the Vaishnava worship, you know, remember we're focusing on Vishnu. They might chant the name of Vishnu or his avatars again and again. You know, this is sort of Japa. Um, and uh, if you want particular examples, you could sort of think about things like the Hare Krishnas. There's a few um, fill in the blanks exercises, the end of your PowerPoint, just to sort of round everything off. So once you've finished your worksheet, then have a go at this as well and see if you can figure out uh, the right bits that should be filled in. Some of these answers will be based off of things you learned yesterday or in the previous lessons. So you may need to look back in your work to be sure. OK, I don't doubt there will be questions. Um, Remember at philosophymonster.weebly.com, there are links to various websites about Hinduism, and uh, there may well be useful links there that tell you more about Vaishnavism, Shaivism, as well as things like the Shiva Linga. So if you want further information, that's probably a really good place to go. OK, um, of course, if you do have any questions, you're welcome to email me and uh, I will try and give you the best answers that I can. OK, uh, but I hope you're all keeping well. Look after yourselves and uh, you'll hear from me soon. Take care for now.